So how are we doing for time? Two minutes past six. I think we it's in fairness we can wait till five past. Yeah, wait till five past. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. Um, so new people have joined. Rachel, welcome. Joe and Sarah, welcome. Hi. Um, we're just trying to find out where people are. We're, we're coming from all over the country and that's really makes it really exciting. Also finding out if people are going to women's conference this weekend <coughs> and what you do or don't know about the Socialist Health Association. So who have I not spoken to so far? Even? Uh, yes, where are you? Councillor. Oh, you're in Oxford. Yeah, I'm in Oxford. <laughs> ah, lovely. So we've got a bit of an Oxford, well, either both current Oxford, but also former Oxford in, in Cathy, who's, who's helping me out with the tech stuff as well, from her new home in North Wales. Do you know each other? Um, I know Jabu, but um, yes. I'm not sure if I know. Anyone else? Lovely. I know everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, lovely. Joe, you're, in, oh, you're already a member of the SHA and you are on the outskirts of Leeds, fabulous. So we've just been having an argument, sort of me and um, Tiber, because Tiber's in Rotherham. So we were, we we're arguing who is further north. So Leeds is further north. I do accept that than Manchester. But I'm in East Yorkshire. You're, you're East Yorkshire. Yes. Nehol. Where? Nehol. Okay, I think that makes you the northernest. The northeast. <laughs> The North. Possibly. <laughs> I believe There's lots right. of faces that I recognise on here anyway, so that's oh, good. Fabulous, fabulous. All right, we're doing very well. One more minute and we'll say so it's an it's a, is, I hope, a friendly and informal gathering to find out and talk to uh, Socialist Health Association women, who we are, what we do, what what motivated us to join the Socialist Health Association, uh, what sort of campaigning we do, and they and also What's our ask of the Socialist Health Association now in terms of conference? Um, so, you know, if, if, if we do the small presentations, I've just got a small group of us doing presentations, <coughs> just giving a little bit of background and then it's questions and also feel free. What I'm wanting to say is women, feel free to talk about yourselves. Feel free to promote what you do and celebrate what you do. Um, we've just had International Women's Day, but let's, Let's do it forever. International women forever. That's what I say. So I think we have reached that time, five minutes past six. If everybody's comfortable, I am going to invite Coral. And you did ask me the introduction. I got it already. And of course, my phone has now gone off. And <laughs> I will be with you in a moment. So Coral Jones is, has been a GP in Hackney for 30 years, is the chair, the current chair of the London branch of the SHA a member of Doctors in Unite. She's also the Women's Officer for Hackney South in Shoreditch CLP. Take it away, Coral. Okay, thanks very much. I sound a bit manic, don't I? But um, our need to join things keeps growing. So I've been campaigning since 2010, along with many others for publicly owned and staff NHS, paid for general taxation free at the point of use. So I initially joined Keep Our NHS Public and became a Hom Homerton Hospital Governor that's in East London. We were involved in campaigns to stop downgrading the hospital pathology service and oppose closure of the borough rehabilitation centre. But then I joined the SHA and this has really expanded campaigning possibilities. As the SHA is a Labour Party affiliate, we have access to Labour councillors and in London to the GLA members and to the Labour mayor. Councillors have important borough and London wide powers to scrutinise changes and cuts to the NHS and will be very important in challenging the health and care bill. And I know we've got a couple of councillors here tonight, so I look forward to hearing what they're doing about it. The SHA played an important part in mobilising local councillors and patients against the sale of general practices in London to a US multinational company called Centene. So the SHA has strong connections to unions and supports hospital workers to take industrial action on terms and conditions, and very importantly, in challenging outsourcing. And we can be on picket lines without violating these draconian anti-trade union laws. United led a campaign for Circo outsourced workers at Bart's Trust, who have now been taken back in house, which is a huge victory. 
And at the moment, SHA members are supporting security staff at Great Ormond Street, who are still in dispute and again trying to be taken back in house. We've passed the zero COVID motion at London SHA and we speak regularly, a couple of us speak regularly in meetings to retain protections for workers and the public. We campaign on what the so-called wider determinants of health, such as environment, housing and fighting hospital bed closures. So we oppose the building of the Silvertown Tunnel in East London, the expansion of the North East London incinerator in Edmonton. And I see these kind of campaigns as really important in terms of being health campaigners, because once we've got these things, we just have air pollution forever. In terms of the Labour Party front, front bench, London SHA has a mental health subgroup. We're going to be meeting Rosina Allen Khan next week to discuss Labour Party policy. SHA London supports the front bench in their call to oppose the health and care bill and we seek to ensure that this remains Labour Party policy through our campaigning. So there's much to do and it's great to see some new people here and join us in fighting for public NHS and care service. Thanks very much. Thank you very much Cora. I was taking notes there, that's really uh, uh, interesting, particularly the mental health subgroup because it's something I wish we could have in Greater Manchester. It's an area of great interest for me. Um, let me just bring it expand it to be like general. Yeah, that would be lovely. Yeah. Right, I'm trying to do this thing where I bring us back to uh, or so that I can bring in the next person. And for some reason, I'm failing. Why? Ah, that's it because I have to go to this button and go to full screen gallery. Yes. Hello, I'm back. I am great at this technology, honestly, I'm smooth. Um, so thank you, Coral, for opening us up. I'm now going to go over to Oxford and bring in Jabu Nala Hartley. Jabu is the chair of the Oxford Living Wage Campaign. She's also the chair of the Oxford Labour Party and a local city councillor. She's been a long-term advocate and member of the SHA and is also the founder of Ubuntu Mothers for Justice. So, Jabu, if I can bring you in now, um, that would be fantastic. I'm just going to pin the video on you. Everyone's aware because I did send out the uh, message, I think. Has the spotlight gone on to Jabu? Okay. Can everybody see? Hi. Jabu? Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Akwaya. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, yes, as Akwaya uh, said, my name is Jabunala Hartley. Uh, I am based uh, in Oxford. Uh, we are, um, I would say we have a really strong, proud uh, socialist, uh, what you call, um, frontline here. We've recently just uh, taken over the Labour uh, uh, what we call um, EC in our Oxford uh, district. So I'm quite proud of that. Uh, I'm mentioning that, why? Because this is really central to uh, who I am and my campaigning. Although my roots uh, date back, my roots, uh, I trace them to South Africa. I was raised in South Africa under apartheid. So my, uh, my drive to uh, sort of challenge injustices in health, racism, wherever it's it's really it's 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 um something that I was brought up with by by a mom who was a trade unionist, uh, first black woman general secretary in South Africa. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I joined the SHA in uh, I think 2016. So I've been a member for a while, but one of the motivation uh, for joining SHA, I worked in uh, the NHS as a precarious worker for various, uh, uh, what you call source outsourcing um, companies, such as the, uh, what you call um, Clarion, which was later uh, disbanded. Um, I've worked for the hospital itself, as NHS, I've worked for the, um, uh, oof, I've, sorry, it's just slipped my mind, but uh, I've worked as an outsource worker, but mostly in, not as a clinician, but in administrative roles and also as a, a cleaner. So I saw firsthand in um, 
how workers were treated in terms of workers working under the most horrendous conditions where they had no rights. The workers that were uh, contracted to work, their contracts were constantly under threat, but it was, it was even worse when you uh, came in as a, a gig worker in terms of your uh, stratification where you could be dismissed at any time, that sort of insecure, insecure type of work. I um, joined the SHA because I was in, you know, interested in this socialist health association. Anything that uh, uh, said anything about socialism, I really wanted to know what exactly uh, was their angle on this uh, fantastic uh, system, which uh, for me, I grew up uh, knowing that socialism could bring fairness uh, to, our, to our lives, especially as far as equalities and equities in some of our really downtrodden uh, communities. So my campaigning is really, really uh, quite broad because as much as I am part of the SHA, I am really uh, kind of focusing on different issues that affect our communities as far as inequalities are concerned. Uh, as as uh, Eko said earlier, I'm the chair of the Oxford Living Wage campaign. So we campaign for the Oxford Living Wage, but it doesn't mean that we accept uh, the uh, what you call the speculated wage. We still we truly believe that um, the standard of living in Oxford is really expensive for 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 low paid workers. So it needs to be really addressed in terms of how much uh, how much uh, people are paid here. It's uh, it's really sad. I was speaking to a friend of mine yesterday, who works as an administrator, who's now worried about um, the new energy bills. Well, she talked about uh, she's worried that uh, after everything has been taken from her, she'll only be left with 200 pound a month. This is a worker. Uh, this is, uh, it, it, it's, it's absolutely disgraceful that in the UK, people are being pushed into that uh, kind of corner. And she's even thinking about she has to live in, she has to leave Oxford because uh, of, the, of the disparities that, she has to she has to face uh, for her children and for herself. Mm -hmm. So I my my part of campaigning really uh, also means going up and down the country and just raising uh, awareness and 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 just uh, instilling uh, jo joining solidarity campaigns to really try really trying hard to actually establish a powerful workers movement can fight for our rights. And I believe it's got that element, but uh, through throughout the sort of pandemic, we've tried to, we, me and some of my colleagues, we try to address this through various uh, issues, especially uh, the vaccines. I led on the Why Vaccinate campaigns, which were taking place in Oxford. I um, I joined the the strikers at the Banbury uh, JD, which was about the the, the 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 fire and rehire. I joined the Royal Kingdom uh, workers in in Reading, who were fighting for pay pay uh, pay rise and outsource against outsourcing. Uh, there's also plenty of campaigns in Oxford that have been taking place around the St. Mungo's and their outsourcing of workers. Uh, it, 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 it's huge. Uh, we've woken up early in the morning with my colleagues, Mark, Mark Ladbrook, one uh, president of the NA, of the uh, Socialist Health Association, uh, fighting for NHS pay justice and, and, and trying to show the frontline workers that uh, we stand. Uh, we stand with them. We 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 stand with them in in fighting for a pay justice. Yes, uh, and I think it's really thank thank you, Jabu. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I'll let you continue, but I think it's really important that one of the things the SHA does really well is it sees its position um, in terms of health, how it is, how it's impacted by so many other issues and the sort of activism. If we can come back and dig into that a little bit more in the second half of the session, that would be fantastic. Mm. Is that okay? Thank you okay. very much for your contribution. Right. So I'm going to come back out um, to the gallery. 
And I'm going to invite our third speaker, so uh, Teresa Clark. I've got this list here. Oh, I've also got a new phone. So Teresa Clark is the current chair of the Women's Conference Arrangements Committee, WCAC, or as people call it, and is on the ballot to continue this year. She was one of the key instigators of the conference being reinstated and led on the Telford AWC to 2019, which I didn't get to and I hear all the time, women just so thrilled about that first in-person conference after such a long time. So I try not to listen, listen to it because I just get jealous. Um, she's just joined the SHA to help us battle for health and social care equity for all. Uh, over to you, Teresa. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ekwa. Thanks so much, Ekwa. Thank you all for being here and thank you, SHA, for inviting me. It's my daughter's birthday today. She's 35. 35 years ago, to the beloved day, I gave birth to my daughter and the hospital bed broke apart underneath me, and there were no epidurals left. The NHS was underfunded in 1987, and it still is in 2022, with privatization an ever-growing threat. Three weeks ago, my partner had an eye operation. The NHS clinic, underfunded, understaffed, sent them to spec savers. Free at the point of use, yes, but with our NHS tax money going into private profits and private pockets. I joined SHA to fight for our NHS and against privatisation for my daughter, my granddaughter, my partner, and for all of us. I'm especially glad on, of Shah's stress on equalities be it their analysis of racism in health or their stand against the attacks on healthcare for our trans siblings. I'm also a trade unionist. I've been a trade unionist since I've been a shop steward since 1971. And I was very active in our local Save Lewisham Hospital campaign, which we won. We prevented the closure of accident and emergency and maternity provision at Lewisham Hospital. Massive campaign with health unions, with local communities and with the TUC, which I'm proud to be a Unite delegate to our local TUC. Equalities is my priority. And I'm standing for Women's Conference Arrangements Committee again this year, after five years as chair and vice chair, to protect our Telford wins. Telford is famous amongst women in the Labour Party and maybe even wider, because it was the single most diverse and inclusive event that the Labour Party has ever, ever held. And that's because of the double delegate diversity provision that means that any CLP can have two delegates so long as at least one of those sisters is a woman of colour or disabled or lesbian, bi or trans. Obviously, that's partly about the diversity of conference itself and representation and listening to voices which are hardly heard but it's also about the ethos of our CLPs because we want to support CLPs in being places in which sisters feel confident and comfortable in their identities and in declaring their identities and saying, I'm disabled, as indeed I am disabled, you can't see it, but I am disabled, I am a lesbian, whatever. If re-elected, we were asked about our ask of Shah, if we re elected this year, I'll work with Shah and with Socialist Sisters on the National Women's Committee, like Equa, 
to offer regional and national and in each nation events for women around the country, including a focus on health, on women's health and on health equalities. Thank you for having me. Unmute. <clears throat> I have to mute because I have, I'm coughing at the moment. We fingers crossed that's all okay. Um, thank you very much. I wanted to actually say um, as well from the previous one. So the Social Health Association absolutely fights for and wants to safeguard the National Health Service, but we don't do it uncritically. We recognize that there are problems. We recognize that particularly issues around race that uh, Jabu mentioned earlier, but we, we, we don't wanna see them used as an excuse to privatize the NHS, but we're not an un, we are a critical friend, not an uncritical friend. And we're trying to do that for our shadow cabinet. Uh, and that's what part of this is about. So thank you um, also for that link. I think it's really important. This meeting was about why labor women join the SHA. Um, I think it's why all women should join the SHA, but because of this, you know, they've got conference coming up and it felt it really important for us to understand why, uh, how the SHA fits into the picture of our wider campaigning. Right, I'm going to bring in Andrea. I have to come out of this so I can find you all. Um, Andrea Gilbert. Uh, right, I have a lovely bit of spiel about you as well, Andrea. And I keep touching the wrong button on my phone because it's also a new phone. So Andrea is a community organizer and housing caseworker for Unite. She's a delegate to the ones with Trades Council and a Labour Councillor candidate for West Putney uh, for these upcoming elections in May. She's recently set up a health and homelessness working group within the Socialist Health Association. Hi everyone, um, thank you for having me here this evening. I am currently on my way to doing an action against the Tories, so sorry if you hear a lot of cars, I'm currently outside and we're going to be getting off in a bit. But yeah, I joined the um, Socialist Health Association um, this year. I have been working a lot on um, NHS campaigns, so I've been supporting We Own It, um, Just Treatment, Keep Our NHS Public and um, my union Unite as well. Um, in terms of um, why I'm here, well, um, I'm also the Secretary of Labour Homelessness Campaign, and we have been fighting for our homeless to um, be registered for um, GPs and also to get the vaccination. So, um, funny enough, yesterday, NICE actually put out new guidelines as well for, um, for homeless people to get extra support into um, health services and also ensuring that the um, health services that they are pro provided actually meet their needs as well and also comes um, you know depending on what needs they actually have so in terms of you know their physical health needs mental health and obviously um, signposting them onto relevant services that can support them um, Yes, I have recently just set up the Socialist um, Health Association's homeless group, and it's coming along um, nicely. Actually, we are um, in the yeah, we're in the process now of having a WhatsApp group set up, and um, more of the Labour homelessness campaign are also um, joining the Socialist Health Association, which is good for us as well. So it gets more people organising, and also gets more people. Um, yeah, focused on homelessness and the actions that need to be taken to ensure that this group of people actually get the support that they need. And it's not just, you know, a sometime-ish thing as well. We need it to be consistent because, yeah, people are literally suffering. For example, 78% of the homeless actually have mental health issues and the majority of them actually have physical health issues as well. So, um, yeah, that's pretty, um, pretty much it from me. But if people do want to join the WhatsApp group or, um, yeah, join us in what we're doing, then um, please get in touch with the Socialist Health Association and they will forward it on to me. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck for where you're going. I'm assuming you're having to get off now. Thank you, Andrea, very much for your contribution. We probably have a, a couple of other people coming in. Sorry, let me just uh, go to the gallery again um who are out and about on activity and i'm not sure if irene's joined us she was she's over in liverpool and she's organizing for the in for blackpool uh the uh 
challenge to the Tory party conference in Blackpool. I think that's an a whole series of events starting tomorrow. I'm not sure she can join us. So I'm going to leap again out from London, which is where Andrea was, if you couldn't tell from the accent, out to Rotherham. We're going out to uh, Rotherham in Yorkshire to Tiber Yassine. Tiber, are you with us? Hi. Yeah. I am. Hi, everybody. I'd quickly left just to go and get a drink. The, the the virtues of virtual uh, you know meetings um i thought it might be useful just listening to the speakers it's been nice for me because i don't know everybody on this call either um is that why we became members of sha um you know we all go to a lot of meetings and a lot of meetings become talking shops and it's like uh, this this circular conversation that we have and I remember in that first year of the pandemic and everything that was happening to most places that we would access support, um, I just knew then the NHS was something very important to me. Um, and um, that inspired me to join SHA because when I did my research, I'm really interested in joining policy forums that have, a, have some influence. Um, otherwise, we're literally not making anything happen. We still, it's still nice to speak and give solidarity to one another, but also now we need action <laughs> with that conversation. And that's what eventually doing a lot of research and there was a lot of call out to have more diversity in, in, in SHA. And I can only talk about the kind of more Yorkshire kind of perspective on this, um, that I, I responded and I, and I joined. Um, I should give you just a bit of background. Uh, I work for the University of Sheffield. I actually work at the medical school. I help to run the programs to represent underrepresentation in medicine. So that's kind of, it's, it's nationally known as widening participation. So that's kind of the area that I work in. Um, and uh, I also am a counselor uh, in Rotherham. Uh, I was inspired to go into politics after my, in my town where I've, I've, uh, I've lived here for most of my life. Um, um, we failed local people. Uh, we were known for uh, CSC, which many of you read about, child sex sexual exploitation. And that right really was, I'd been a member for probably over 12, maybe 13 years at that point. Um, and that was my kind of slow journey into maybe I need to become more active. So that's how I got into politics. Um, and now it eats up my entire life, I feel like. <laughs> Um, that just gives you a little bit of perspective. My, my historical background is from the community sector. So when I joined SHA, interestingly, I was talking to a lot of my students. I'm in a quite a privileged position at work. I can talk politics, <laughs> the nature of the work and low level politics, obviously. And um, interestingly, the, the vice chair of the Yorkshire Humber part of SHA was until last year a student of ours at the medical school um, and with him we created this idea of going out to different CLPs and I said look if we're trying to the reason I came into SHA was to how can we strengthen this idea of influencing policy around healthcare then actually we need to educate people more around this possible forum so um, we through the Yorkshire Humber we did a, a number of sessions with CLPs all virtual so that it did make it easier doing it virtually so that kind of campaigning I think there's an element of campaigning internally as well as externally internally how do we make this stronger so it continues to have an influence the front bench you know because if we're not doing that they're going to lose people like me because I'm just interested in how do we get our health policies reflecting the the wider co community that we represent and mean something to us um, and just to give you um, a few of the campaigns that I'm really interested in, in, in taking forward and how I take the work of the SHS and the things I've learned from other members. So one area is that, um, you know, learning, even though I may be a woman of color, I've, ne I've never had children. And I had no idea the desperate situation that women find themselves whilst giving birth and the choices and difficult choices that they have to make. And I knew that um, in my, in my counselor role, um, I took on a role of the chair of the health select committee to pursue certain perspectives that had been 
been missed for many years. So just recently, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I led on um, a, um, a work with the hospital to do a review of their maternity services, so part of the scrutiny function. Uh, and that was the first time that had ever been done. And a particular request as part of that was to have a race element to that presentation. And that was not easy. <laughs> uh, people don't like using the word race or the word black, even if that's on the agenda, which has been an interesting, uh, you know, things to discover, even where we are in history now. Um, and that conversation has now meant that that would be something that we will keep an eye on. I'm just interested in what can we influence to bring people in to talk about it? If it means part of that means put in a bit of further scrutiny on an issue, which is about equitable services, and I'm, I'm interested in that. And I know if, if SHA membership hadn't happened, I might have not been fueled in that way to pursue that as part of my councillor role. Um, so I just want to maybe for new members who are interested, well, how can they use this forum? That's been great. One area which is a very new thing, which I'm, I'm passionate about, and we've talked about the privatization of the uh, uh, of healthcare, or oh, it's already happening. You know, it's not like oh, it's going to happen. It's happening. And one area is like many people. I, I've got a long term health condition, so I, I had it from personal experience. Is access to medication. Some of you may be aware that when you some people who've got long term health conditions, uh, we have an opportunity to uh, we all pay for our medication, but we can buy a long term. Uh, it's like a subsidized. Uh, process where we can buy uh, a certification that allows us to to have as many medications in a given month and we, we we get charged a monthly fee I think it goes up every year so I think it's something like maybe 12 pounds or something like that at the moment um, one of the things I noticed in the last few years is that as part of my annual drug review with my GPs, it's not the GP fault, this, this is all policy, and particularly Tory policy, is that I was constantly getting told I can't have X, Y, Z, I have to pay for it now. And I'm like, yeah, but you're charging me double. And so I would counter the argument. And it taught me a big thing fighting that is they're not used to people asking questions. You know, most people that we speak to are someone can be very vulnerable when they're in the healthcare. They don't want that argument or that debate or that discussion. And I realized the pharmacy was having the discussion with me, was not used to it. So when I was asking her questions back, she was like, well, well uh, I'm really sorry, but I just got to ask these questions. I said, well, can you feed back that I'm not going to pay for those things and I will challenge it because I have right to have this medication. Um, and so one of the things, from that is a campaign around those things. Then some of the changes are happening are don't seem huge, they seem very little and they almost hidden unless you're experiencing it. And that's a really important thing about healthcare. You know, some of it is very the, under the belly, but they where some of our biggest fights are and the pushback needs to happen. So that's one campaign that I'll be bringing to SHA and how do we, how do we challenge some of that process to the CCG. Um, second one, is actually for counsellors. And um, I discovered while being a counsellor is that we don't have, when we go for um, into hospital for medical care, we may have a legitimate sick note, that none of that is recognised. You know, I don't get a dispensation when I go into hospital. If I miss a meeting, it's just classed as I've missed a meeting. You know, um, it's classed as the same way somebody's gone on holiday, somebody visiting somebody, uh, somebody deciding just not to go that night. Um, and I don't agree with that. <laughs> uh, how can we be a party about some of the socialist values that we have? And that is something that's not recognized. Uh, this, it, it puts a greater scrutiny on what we really mean about support around disability agenda and furthering that agenda. Um, in the end, it doesn't affect me. I know I turn up to most things. However, I know it's affecting some people. So that's, a, 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 I, I really do believe SHS has got a unique role in how do we, for people who are elected to positions, for when they've got legitimate reason not to be somewhere, for that to be recognised and it's not recognised a process. Good thing is some things are, so for example, maternity leave is now, but somebody fought for that. Somebody challenged that. That's not like being there forever, that, that, that recognition in the process. Um, just shut me up, Akua, because you know, I, I'm mindful of time. 
so I'm, I'm I'm happy to leave it there, but I suppose I just wanted to focus on where I'm taking action, but also to influence others. If you're interested in any of those challenges, um, I, I would really welcome some kind of collaboration on some of those things. Yeah, and that's lovely because that's what I want this meeting to do is to draw people in and tell them, tell us where we want to go and us, for, to, for us to share that as well. That's really interesting, that last point that you were saying, because I am on the uh, National Women's Committee and it's a really odd role. So a lot of it, I'm actually just going out there independently because I'm the vice chair, I can do that, trying to support women. And because our overarching role is to support women in the party, particularly into leadership roles, I've been, and I'm a, and I'm a counsellor myself, but I'm 60, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm past, uh, I have other issues, but I'm past childbearing, for example. Now, it is maternity leave is not actually standard or st across the country. I've just unfortunately I was supporting a counsellor in Suffolk, and she had been fighting to get her maternity leave recognised from before she was actually pregnant. She's the only person of childbearing age on the council, which I think is another issue as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it never got passed. And in the end, her her absence was just noticed, noted as absence, like you say, rather than that she was on maternity leave. Absolutely. And it became to a point where she actually gave up being a counsellor. And these are the sorts of things that me on the National Women's Committee needs to be able to fight and recognise in terms of women. It's, it's all very well us saying we want women in leadership mm -hmm. positions, but women um, are going to be impacted by a lot of things that were, and I think that partnership with the Socialist Health Association is one of the things I hope to do because I'm on the National Women's Committee, I'm the vice chair, I'm also within SHA, uh, I'm the National Equalities Officer, I want to really make sure that there's a real crossover. It's a bit of the opposite of that stealth, it's, it's a different stealth way because we are struggling in terms of being able to bring these policy motions to our front bench, we're, we're really fighting that. But I think it's there are other ways as well to get into the Labour Party and ha raise these issues, um, and particularly around women's health issues. And because we have that mandate to look at women's leadership, yeah. those two things have to go hand in hand. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really aware. Fair, in Rotherham, we do have it's been recognised now recently and in maternity yeah. leave. So um, and that it does help that we had four new babies which is very unusual, I know. <laughs> we, we've got a slightly younger cohort, I, I, which, I, which I love, and you know, which is wonderful that we are able to provide that and cover as well for certain roles. So that's been, it's a learning, you know, we've had to adopt it and then see how it works. However, a lot of things still not. And it's not about local, it's about how the national party is viewing these agendas and they're not viewing yeah. them. Absolutely, thank you. Um, time is ticking, but it's fantastic. I'm really enjoying listening to what these amazing women are doing and the ask, and I can't wait to involve everybody else in this. We've got uh, three more presentations, and then I'm going to open it out to the floor a little. So uh, we're going back to London. So we've gone to Yorkshire, we're going back to London. And Hile, if you would like to uh, tell us a little bit about why you joined the SHA, I can do you a background intro. I have got that. Uh, I, oh no, I don't. I you can do it if you like. Okay, here. don't worry. Please. Um, so I am a first generation um, immigrant, um, I and I think that's something that's really important for me. And um, I've I've have been working in the NHS for the last ten years in um, in uh, in various roles, in policy roles and operational roles across London in national policy roles. And uh, what I, I think what is really interesting and, I, and within the SHA, actually, I'm, the, um, I'm one of the vice chairs of the National SHA. And I think one of, um, so what is really interesting for me is that NHS is something um, that I have a great love and admi admiration for, and it's, I think in some ways, if you haven't used the health service in other countries, uh, then you tend to appreciate NHS more, that kind of, um, so I have lived in America uh, for a year with my family um, in the last 10 years. And also I'm Iranian, where we've got a very, uh, for the most part, we've got a privatized healthcare system. And actually the relationship that you have, you have with your healthcare providers within the NHS really um, is something that you really value. It does, you know, you, when, when your doctor or your nurse or any other healthcare provider 
tells you something, you don't necessarily need to believe them, but you're, what actually, uh, and they might get it wrong sometimes, and they often do, but what is, uh, what will always be true is that they are giving you the best advice possible in the context of what they think is for your health needs, rather than what would fit best within your, the context of your health insurance, and all the other disparities that might be happening. So in that context, when you have used other healthcare systems, you really appreciate the NHS. But what we do have a real problem in, in the NHS, both in terms of employment, employment rights, and also in terms of um, how we treat our patients, is a real disparity and racism and equalities that, um, that, you know, it's a day to day and the inequalities that you face within the NHS um, as an NHS worker, if you're a person of colour, then that translates itself in the care that you provide for people. So I can give you an example in, in, the, in, in the NHS, um, um, in, the, in the mental health um, um, sector, a lot of our, um, in fact, I was going to say a lot of our nurses, a lot of our mental health nurses tend to be from um, very diverse ethnic backgrounds. A lot of, particularly in London, we've got a, a lot of black or Asian nurses. And in fact, that pretty much applies as well. So the specialities, which has a high proportion of um, Asian, um, Asian, Asian doctors. But actually, that does not get reflected in the policy sectors. So when you go to NHS England, um, in where policy decisions are being made, you do not see many um, senior um, ethnic, uh, ethnically diverse um, policy makers. You do not see many um, senior uh, doctors of color. You do not see many senior nurses of colors, color. And I think, um, and, you know, this is something that actually it, it makes for poor this policy decision making. And we are not particularly good at, in the NHS, we are not particularly good at um, co-production and working with communities to produce services. So, for instance, one of the big things is that if you look at a lot of the patient engagement work that happens in the NHS, um, you would be hard pressed, and this is London, that, that I'm talking about London, in an incredibly ethnic diver, ethnically diverse city, you'll go to patient uh, representative groups, often they are, um, they're often men, but actually a lot of white middle class men and women of um, kind of retirement age. This does not represent me in any shape or form and it's important it doesn't represent me as a um, mother of a young family it doesn't uh, represent me as a woman of working age where you know the hours that the service needs to be open and how I would want to receive uh, my, the service would uh, would work for me and it doesn't represent me in terms of um, in terms of for instance my, uh, my uh, religious identity or my, uh, my other kind of ethnic identity. So for instance, one of the issues that has been a big um, thing, and if you speak a lot um, about um, uh, the, the, the doctors of um, who, um, uh, you know, doctors who deal with end of life will tell you that we are, are how we organize end of life conversations, end of life, preparing the family and preparing the person, all of those things are done uh, with view of patients who are white. And it's not surprising because if all of the conversations are happening with people who, who are white, then it's not surprising that then the experience of people of color is very, very different. Um, so that's where I've been interested in DSHA. I think, unfortunately, the Labour Party 
is I have to admit, I'm as a Muslim woman, I feel that it's an incredibly Islamophobic party. <laughs> and I think that that has been my personal experience. And it's an experience of, you know, the, the latest report by um, 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 Muslim Labour Network seems to, to, to say that that's an experience of a lot of Muslim comrades. And I think it is really important in us uh, for us to actually push uh, the health agenda in that direction as well. We already know what happened during COVID. And at the beginning of COVID, I think, you know, the impression was this is all about um, diversity of income and income inequalities and all of those things. But actually, it turned out that if you are a Bain doctor, you're more likely to die of COVID. A Bain doctor is probably getting, the, you know, even if you're a consultant a Bain doctor, you're more, you are more likely. And all of those things are things that I think is the duty of SSA and due to our campaigning. And that's 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 where my interest is. And I run the um, race and racism group within the SHA. And I would be keen to have these discussions with anyone who is interested to have them or if they would like to join the group. Thank you. Echo, I'll stop because you know me, I'll, I can go on. No, thank you. And that, I, yeah, absolutely. I think it's probably being clear. We have a series of structures um, in the SHA that are set up uh, last year by the, the newly elected Central Council, looking at specific areas of interest. So earlier, um, uh, blah, 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 Andrea was saying about setting up a new one around how, um, health and homelessness. I um, chair the one that has sort of drew together this event but also an event we had earlier about an introduction to health inequalities which is the health and social care inequalities steering group there are there are numbers of others some of them are very practical some of them are about campaigning generally about comms but you know there's a lot of opportunity within the SHA to actually uh, get involved and do stuff so um, I know that um, Akile's uh, invitation to join the the race and health group is, is a genuine one and if you're interested she would she would welcome you so I'm going to continue. I know time is going well. We've got 10 minutes to seven and I have uh, two really interesting speakers. And I know I've also got speakers, uh, other speakers in the crowd to join us uh, in the crowd. The crowd. You, know, you can tell I've, where am I at a sort of concert or something uh, somewhere wonderful and not being able to operate how to change my view. Um, so I'm going to ask Catherine. Uh, so we're coming out of London again, and we are going to recently arrived in Cardiff, but Wales based since I've known her, uh, Catherine Thomas. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Is that okay, Catherine? Yeah, of course. Um, it's absolutely terrific to be um, in such an enthusiastic and interesting bunch of women. It's brilliant. And I have to say, because I, I first got involved with the SHA probably in the early 90s um, and was a council member from 2018 until I resigned in 2020 and some people might understand why that happened but I mean the, the uh, number of, of younger women who've joined the SHA and the diversity I mean the energy you can feel it and I think the SHA council average age has dropped significantly and that's what we really needed you know you can get a bit moribund if it's just people my age you know and older because we've seen it all before and we don't have the ideas and we don't have the enthusiasm so it's brilliant to hear younger women coming in and and you know taking up the baton um because when i joined the sha i i i qualified as a doctor and hated it. i hated medical school i hated working in hospitals and then the my turning point came when i went to princess park health center and some of you might have heard about the inspirational health center in liverpool um and i wanted to plug the book by my uh, GP trainer, Dr. Katie Gardner, she's written a book um, with Susanna Graham Jones called uh, A Radical Practice. So if you Google that or look on News From Nowhere, the radical bookshop in, in Liverpool, um, and that was absolutely inspirational and packed full of ideas of how we can do public health and primary health care, how we can do healthcare in general a lot better. And we could really kind of go back to what's worked in the past um, and that we've kind of lost in the last 10 years. Um, so yes, and I, then I fell in love with general practice and worked in, in um, Liverpool for, for many years and then moved to the Welsh Valleys, back home to Wales in the Welsh Valleys. Um, and really it's been a combination of, of learning that um, 
What really matters is community, is relationships, is social networks, isn't it? And that we organise together as communities um, that are open to everybody, you know, that we are, we welcome everybody and we build relationships and take things forward positively. And then we put in place public services that are full of people who are able to do the best that they can um, supported to do the best that they can. And I heard somebody yesterday say the most powerful thing as a service provider, whether that's in the health service or anywhere else, is that you are a person who gives a shit. So, you know, when any of us go and use the service, we want to, to be talking to somebody who cares. And that's the first thing, isn't it? And then you want them to be competent and capable and all that as well. But so I think that those are the two big things and why I've kind of gone between general practice and public health because it's those two things. What do you do for a population in a place? And what do you do as an individual um, health carer? So the, the only other thing I want to say quickly is um, that you, we can really learn from the devolved nations. And Alison here, Alison Schooler is a chair of SHA Cymru Wales. I have to say, it's great living in a country where you've got a government that's been left of centre since 1999. So policy and strategy is um, is great. We're maybe not so great at implementation sometimes, and some of that is because you're working against a Westminster government, and some of the policies uh, just it, you just don't have the power to be able to make a difference. Um, but also, we struggle with with um, funding. You know, we're, it, strategies are great, but unless you have the money, you you know you can't make your health service as good as you, you you want it to be so but you know in in wales and scotland and uh, we are trying to to um to do the right thing and it's a great pleasure to be in an sha where you've got politicians and assembly members who are members of the sha and active in the sha so um yeah if we can share that a, a, a bit more that would be great so i don't want to say any more because i know we're running out of time but go and buy a radical practice lots to yeah. learn from that Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to bring in um, Barbara, uh, Bar Barbara Robert from um, London now, but I'm really aware that Alison is in the audience and also Kathy's also in Wales. Um, so uh, after but it's really important to hear from Barb. Uh, she's a, a disability activist uh, involved in campaigns across the country. So we're going to bring in Barb now and we will have uh, a chance to talk with her and then see I'm I'm happy to stay on for another ten minutes, but um, I also want to wrap it up. So it's over to you for your presentation, Barb, and then we'll see where we are with everyone else. Welcome. Hi, thank you, Kia, and thank you for hosting this uh, important fringe event. Yeah, um, I was actually a nurse in my younger years before my health problems, disabilities, prevented me from doing that, and then but since. I was able to get online uh, in 2010, 2011. I joined the Labour Party in 2011, and I've gradually got more and more involved in disability activism through the Labour Party. I'm disability officer, I've been disability officer since 2018, but also in um, disability labour and groups outside um, the Labour Party structure, such as DPAC. I'm um, also um, involved in, with my uh, Unite Community Hackney and Islington branch. So I say I've been trying to make points for quite some time now, because sadly women are still being disfranchised by their male counterparts in all walks of life. And it's even harder when that woman is disabled, fighting for acceptance and accessibility on all platforms in society, and disabled have borne the brunt of Tory austerity, and before that, I have to say, you know, the Tory austerity for at least coming up to 12 years, we've been hit by financial hardships. Disabled women have taken their own lives you know, in desperation because they just can't take any more cruelty from the DWP and the whole benefit system is a disgrace, which is one of 
things I've been involved in is scrapping universal credits, both, both through Unite and to UC Disabled Workers um, Committee, and also with my own Labour Party, passing a motion to scrap universal credit. And health inequalities, disabled, disabled face. I mean, during the height of the COVID pandemic, DNRs were placed on them without either their knowledge or their family's knowledge, you know? So, and now we've got um, the, you know, we're suffering, uh, you know, the poverty and fuel crisis because of the rising cost of living. And again, it's women who are more likely to suffer most than their male counterparts. I, you know, facing the choice between heating and eating. So anyway, I joined the SHA well, back in 2018, um, partly because as a socialist, I wanted to see socialism put back into the socialist health association, but also disabled women's voices need to be heard now more than ever. I believe the SHA can be that campaigning vehicle as we try to tackle these health inequalities and benefit inequalities, which will directly impact your health, depression and suicide, mental illness and stuff. And, and also, you know, we do need policies and we need policies to be developed at every level with us as equals, not top down and sadly bloke influenced. I'll finish with this because we, as we say, it's our party let us in and there's, there's nothing about us without us.